The war in Ukraine has entered a new phase of brutality as Russia seems to be targeting civilians trying to flee their country. This is a moment for leadership. Pregnant women and children have become the latest victims of this war. This is a moment for strength. Russia expands its war to every part of Ukraine, striking a military base less than 15 miles from the Polish border. This is a moment for wisdom and experience. Be not afraid. This is a moment to strengthen alliances. Never, ever give up hope. This is a moment for courage. Never doubt. This is a moment for compassion. Never tire. This is a moment for truth over propaganda. It will not be easy. This is a moment for one president. There will be cost. America's president. This is the task of our time. This is a moment for President Joe Biden. Be not afraid. Join us for a discussion about the war in Ukraine and the current threat to democracy in the United States and around the world. On April 17th at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, author and attorney Rich Proceda would do a short presentation and lead a group discussion. Rich Proceda is the founder of the Truth and Democracy Coalition and the producer of Democracy Under Fire, a show covering the threat to democracy and what we can do about it. He studied law and international service at American University in Washington, D.C., and he authored a textbook on global studies. To register, go to tinyurl.com slash Ukraine must not fall. That's tinyurl.com slash Ukraine must not fall. And I'll see you there. Public reporting. A DC Mayor Muriel Bowser first called Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy to ask for help at 1:34 p.m. It looks now like the Capitol the, the police. Yeah, now, Pete. Let me break away from you a second because things are happening very quickly. According to your written testimony, you were, quote, aware that demonstrators had breached the Capitol. All right, so my name is Richard Proceda. I'm with the Truth and Democracy Coalition, and I do a podcast called Democracy Under Fire, and this is going to be a recording of that podcast. And I have with us today um, minister and, and activist um, Dom Jones, and uh, she's going to talk to us about race and democracy. And this is because we're trying to save democracy. And if we're going to do that, we're going to need to reach across political lines. We're going to need to reach out to the center. Uh, we're going to need more than support, more of the, than half of Americans on our side if we have to overthrow a dictatorship and even 50 percent given the situation with voting rights right now may not be enough to win it certainly isn't in gerrymandered districts so dom jones so we're going to need to reach out to the center whether we like it or not and dom jones is a minister She's a community activist. She works with businesses and community leaders in Huntington Beach, California, to address problems of homelessness, to advocate for youth and community services. And as an African-American woman in a conservative community, she organizes across political lines daily. And as a minister, she seeks to bring communities together. So she was going to lead a discussion with us about democracy and race and 
how we can build uni unity across political lines and how we can uphold the values of freedom for all people, establish and maintain a true citizen-led citizen democratic government and ensure a better democracy for our future generations. So um, Dom, there you go, you're on. Thank you, Richard, for that very kind opening, very gracious of you. Um, hello, everyone, and good to see you all this lovely Sunday afternoon. And we get to have a very interesting, robust, full, and lively discussion uh, amongst us all about democracy and about where we stand as a nation today, where we've been, where we're going, and why we're here today. And as someone who is a spiritual person, I'm a spiritual practitioner. I'm someone that believes in bringing us together in harmony and unity and finding togetherness and finding where we meet so that we can achieve the goals we ultimately all want. Because at the end of the day, my friends, we all desire some of the basic same things. We all desire peace, happiness, joy, uh, sustainability, safety, and we desire to be well and healthy. We may have different ways about how we get there sometimes, but we have to figure out how to build those bridges. So um, again, it's my honor to speak with you all, and I look forward to taking your questions afterward. We're going to go through a few questions as it relates to democracy and racial relations and where we are today. One of the first things we want to talk about is how do we build unity across political lines? And that is a very a discussion that is fraught with a lot of contention. It's fraught with a lot of ideas about how to go about creating unity. However, I believe that we need to come to a consensus on a number of things first. And today, Republicans, Democrats, or independents, and even apolitical respondents, many people agree that the one thing that we are most in harmony on is the layers of division that have sunk in deep into our society. And again, how do we get through that? One of the ways that I see us getting there is how is humanizing people rather than harmonizing into a party. You know, we are, are invented political parties to articulate our views, but not to invent views for us to fight over. And that is something that we as a collective get to recognize and understand every day. And as it relates to America and the issues that we have embedded with race, America has a deep history with race, as we know. Uh, for 400 years, there was slavery in this country. And unfortunately, so many people bled and died and suffered in the whole system, whether it was the, the, the people who were slaves or the slaveholders themselves. Everyone in one way or another were a part of a structure that wasn't healthy for our country. And that system that has such created a stain on our country, what it has done at this point is there are struggles today that are still there. It's like sweeping a floor and you're just sweeping the dirt under the rug, but the dirt is still there. And that's what we as a country have. We have a lot of things we need to break down and face and, 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 and stand in front of. Everyone does on every side of uh, politi the political spectrum. And in doing so, there's important to understand something that people of different races and parties are, tr we need to try to work together to address the real problems in communities across our country. Partisanship is, is really sometimes too high a bar to leap over now. And what is in our reach, however, is partnership, partnership. And, you know, many people have different beliefs uh, and faiths, and I honor them all. I am someone that has grew up uh, studying and reading the Bible on a daily basis. And the biblical Noah, he gathered animals in pairs to sail the waters of uncertainty in his time, according to the Bible. And we also must become pragmatic people working together in pairs, if you will, Republicans and Democrats, independents and the like, in uh, the public and the private partnerships in our quest to improve our society. See, so we must come together, we must harmonize. Another problem point is this, we wanna focus on problems, not people. 
We need to see the problem as the enemy and not the people. And let's take some hard factual examples. Let's use the Capitol Hill riot on January 6th as an example. The rioters involved uh, were in many cases uh, supporters of Donald Trump, uh, uh, many of them carrying paraphernalia and guns and the like. Um, they were primarily male supporters of Donald Trump. Some were women. We know, unfortunately, a woman did perish. Um, and based on our available information, and it's safe to assume that many of these people, not all of them, but many of them were Republicans uh, and, and of, of that like. And the problem in that event was the loss of life, the destruction of the property, and the psychological threat that this riot caused to duly elected members of Congress and the American public. The enemy is the violence and the other is destruction. It's, it's, not the, uh, it's not those who have a different belief system. It's the destruction and the chaos and the violence that is perpetuated. So it's important to understand this as well. And you guys, I'm talking about this with you frankly, openly, and in a good spirit, because we're fighting too much. We're fighting too much. We are coming to each other with swords and, 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 and sometimes thinking that that's the only way to accomplish. And we as human beings are so much better than that. We are so much better than that. And we can accomplish so much. So let's move forward. We're talking about unity. We're seeing our divisions. We're seeing the rancor that it causes and what has happened even in uh, the, seeing the uh, January 6th and looking at that issue, what they did, what they did was wrong, but people can believe absolutely anything they desire. This is America. Everyone's entitled to believe something. And as we move along that pathway towards finding bipartisanship, we can take a lesson about finding common ground on the criminal justice reform. For example, reforming prisons through sentencing guidelines Providing an education to incarcerated adults or banning the box on employment applications are some of the few policies, issues that gain sizable agreement among Democrats and Republicans. The American Civil Liberties Union, urban and rural people of color, even, even our American other brothers and sisters. And the question is why? Why can we all tend to agree on criminal justice reform? Our criminal justice system, quite frankly, is a common ground experience for the what we, the people, in ways may think about our public institutions. And I want to give us some information. About 10.7 million people going to jail every year. There are about 2.3 million men and women behind bars. At least 112 million people in 49 states, Washington, D.C., and Guam included, have a criminal record. Our local, state, and federal stakeholders have decided to put priorities sometimes above party and reform beyond race. And we need to apply the same calculus to other areas of American life. It's so very important that we all realize that there are areas that we can come together on. There are areas that we can agree, criminal justice reform as an example, where we can come together, Republican and Democrat, and find harmony and unity. And that's just one of the ways that we can come together. And let's, again, continue forward on our journey as we talk about democracy. Let's talk about how does race affect politics. And that's very, very important. In politics today, unfortunately, people tend to vote along racial lines. Um, our country, in many ways, has been, um, in, and I'm speaking again with an open heart in an understanding way, trying to, I want us to really all understand together. Today, our country, let's say Democrats might try to, how do I say this, <laughs> to sound fair, Democrats pander, they, they work in one, in harmony in one way. Republicans work in harmony in another way. And depending on the different values of each political party and what they hold, that trickles down to the people that are in our system and in our government. We find what we harmonize, what issues harmonize with us, and we vote in line with that. Well, the reality is sometimes we vote in line with our societies. Our societies are our cities. Our cities are our communities. Our communities are our inner circles. Our inner circles are our families. 
And so we vote within the confines and the structures of that system. And we don't often see other perspectives around us. This is where we vote from right here because it's what matters to us. And what is so important to recognize is that everything that matters to you probably likely matters to me. If you want a safe neighborhood, likely I want the same thing too. If you want a peaceful, harmonious city with greenery and beautiful sites for everyone, I likely want the same thing too. It's we have to break down the walls that race and politics where they collide because it causes us to look at each other as the enemy and we're not the enemy. We should never think that we are. Continuing along, whether we are rich or famous or a working class, let's say white person or a working class black person or a working class Asian person or a working class Hispanic person or a working class mixed person, whoever we are, it doesn't matter. What matters, what, it, what, what is important is that we can stand together, come together and we can agree Going to our Capitol, for example, is wrong. Storming the Capitol in a way that was uh, that people died was wrong. We have to agree on basic principles of morality and ethics so that we can move forward. And that starts with us realizing as human beings, I might look different, I might be brown, but we are the same. We are the same inside. And I'll give you this example about unity. I want you to, to listen to this. Imagine I died, I lost my life, and I was an organ donor. And imagine you are in the hospital and you need a heart transplant. You are waiting for someone to donate their heart to you. You're waiting for someone to give you life. So maybe a week after you're in the hospital, the doctor runs to you and says, sir, ma'am, we have a heart for you. Are you gonna ask that doctor, is the person black? Is it, is, is, are they Asian? Are they a male or female? That wouldn't even cross your mind because intrinsically, you know that we are the same and my heart will beat and make me live and it will make you live too. That is the important thing. And that really is the only thing it really is. Let's continue. Anger has been stoked. Anger among our country. Anger is actually one of the densest forms of communication. It conveys more information and more quickly than almost any other kind of emotion. And it has been exploited in our country. It was exploited at the last administration. Donald Trump, he came. He came with those who stood with him on a side that is not for equity and equality for all on a side that does not lift us all up, that is not in the best interest of preserving our democracy, but rather tearing it down and tearing down everything we worked so far. Although we have a trouble checkered past, America, we struggle, but America, we love you. We love you because you keep pushing and you keep trying and you have people like you who are sitting here in this audience determined to defend it. But Donald Trump tried to ruin it and everything that he stands for. And we must stand against that. We must come together, brother and sisters, no matter what we look like or where we come from. And we must do the right thing and fight the fine fight and not allow anger to get into our hearts, not allow anger to cause us to be easily lifted up by the, the political rhetoric of the right or the left. However, let, allow us to really see that as humans, we are working together for more. So as we continue along, um, we've talked about unity. We've talked about the discussion of a little bit about how race collides with that and even how anger comes along. Let's talk more, let's go back into history about the roots of our American democracy as instituted by the founding fathers because we're tying it all together, you see. We're tying together what's happening today. We're tying together race relations. We're tying together our democracy and what it means to defend it and understand our defense and what our founding fathers, what was their true intention. Now, I'm a bit of a history person, so bear with me here, okay? 
about September 19th, uh, uh, 215 years ago, George Washington published his farewell address, marking one of the first peaceful transfers of power in American history and cementing the country's status as the stable democratic state. That was an important transition, my friends. George Washington peacefully transitioning power was really what began to stabilize our democracy into its roots that we are defending today. So, and at that nascent stage in American history, before precedents such as the two-term limit weren't even set. But again, they had limits on how long someone was going to serve. George Washington honored that, and that is a beautiful thing. His farewell address was interesting because his address aimed, what it aimed to do was to call for national unity and end to the squabbling between the parties, between Federalists and Republicans and that, at that time, and an end to the sectionalism of the West and the North and the South. It called for a trying to form something larger than local interest way back then for an infant nation that had resembled more of a loose association of independent states on the Articles of Confederation just years earlier, this message of unity was significant. Our founding fathers, we know, unfortunately, they had great values that they wanted to push forward for democracy, but we know they had some flaws. We know back then that they did own slaves. In fact, all of those who signed the Declaration of Independence owned slaves except for two. All of them owned slaves, and at that time, they perpetuated a system that we are suffering from today. And for that conduct, for, for, for making others slaves, that hurts me because those slaves are my ancestors. That's in my blood. Their blood runs in me. So I, I, am, I am not at all, I, I, I completely do not accept what was done. However, however, and I do say however with boldness, I appreciate that the form of government that we are trying to protect was put in place by the initial founding fathers and we have moved forward through the vector of history and time and as the arc of history goes towards justice, we go to make it a more and more perfect union. And we are all children and we are all citizens of that goal. The American experiment was launched in 1776 with that Declaration of Independence from the English Crown. The US Constitution was framed in 1787 and ratified in 1789. The all important Bill of Rights was added in 1791. In 1865, the 13th Amendment of the US Constitution abolished slavery. There we go, we are moving forward. And in 1868, the 14th Amendment declared all persons born or naturalized in the United States as citizens of our country. We have moved forward constantly. And even the 19th admit, ad, Amendment added a prohibition against denying the right to vote on the basis of sex, finally recognizing women as full persons entitled to the rights of citizenship under law. Our country is the greatest experiment that any other country has ever embarked upon. That's what the great experiment is about. That is what we're fighting for. We are fighting for when someone flies from China and they live in a homogenous country or from Africa, they live in a homogenous country or from any other place in the world. They live in countries where people tend to all look similar. But here you land in New York, JFK, you land at LAX in Los Angeles and we are all so different and beautiful and learning how to live together with every different belief, every different color, the genders, everything is beautiful. It's what makes our nation magnificent. And that is what we continue to fight for. So when Donald Trump became president in his administration, there was a big alarm bell that rang for us all. An alarm bell said that we all needed to wake up and we all needed to remember that democracy is not something that just stands forever. It must be consistently fought for day in and day out by those who thirst and hunger for its freedom and its beauty. How do we uphold the values of freedom for all people? Establish and maintain a true citizenry led democratic government and ensure a democracy that's better for future generations. My oh my, my friends, that is a big question that cannot be answered by me but by all of you, but all of what you know we must do and the harmony we must get to bring. There's a scripture in the Bible, in the book 
of Proverbs, chapter three. And it mentions, it says, seek for it as for hidden treasures, search for it as for gold, keep seeking wisdom and you shall find it. Keep seeking knowledge and you will expose it as hidden treasures and it will continue to reveal to you. Now, to some of you, I'm, I could sign a sound a number of ways, but here is the reality. I want us all to fight for democracy. I want us all to learn to agree and meet on issues and topics that we can work together on. And I want us to use that, get toothsome about it. Use that as the way to move forward in unity together. I want us to understand that we are all responsible and we are all inherently given the honor of being born here in this great nation or becoming citizens of this great nation. And we have a duty to fight and to stand with those who want to fight with us. I'm grateful for Richard because Richard, my friends, on this podcast and this show is doing the great work of galvanizing others towards understanding how democracy must be fought for, where we are today. So let's close it out together. And I look forward to talking more with you. America is the great experiment. Over 200 years we've been here, but we have a long way to go. We've had over 400 years of slavery. We get to continue to make amends and find ways to love one another and harmonize and heal those who are still hurting from that tragedy of slavery and how it has divided us in countries, in cities, and so many other topics that we can't talk about and so much we can go on all day, redlining and you name it. Our founding fathers, they weren't perfect, but they began something that we continue to perfect. And democracy is not something that will just sit here and give you all of its wonderful beauty and goodness. Democracy is you walking down the street feeling freely without being accosted. Democracy is you being able to say how you feel your voice, whether whatever you believe across the political spectrum, and it's okay. It's okay. I love democracy, your hair. Democracy is going about, thank you, love. Democracy is going about every day, creating the life that you want in a country that lets you live how you want to live freely. So my friends, I love you. And I will say that and I say it all the time. I don't have to know you to love you. I love you because you are here doing the good work. I love you because you are with me together in this. I love you because you know, you and I together know that equality and coming together and fighting for it is what we have to do. We're willing to do the good work. Keep on doing it. Keep pushing. Look to history as a marker. Do not stop watching the signs and continue to spread the good work and fulfill the wonderful good news, I say, that we are going towards a more, better, perfect union.